In the past few years, certain events have come to light that suggest perhaps our own government has not always been honest and forthcoming with us about certain government projects. Some have gone so far as to suggest that many of these strange events are part of a planned and ongoing conspiracy. Have American officials actually approved medical experiments on prisoners without their knowledge? Have there been secret experiments affecting whole populations? Did the Navy actually attempt to make a World War II ship invisible? Is it possible that the experiment actually worked and that the ship suddenly reappeared moments later in another naval yard hundreds of miles away? And not only hundreds of miles away, but years into the future. If there was such an experiment, did the crew know about it, or were they used as unwitting guinea pigs? Has the government used individual citizens, groups, even whole cities as test subjects without telling them what was going on? Have researchers usurped the work of some of our greatest scientists in order to conduct secret studies on time travel, interdimensional transit, and mind control without the participants' knowledge? Albert Einstein did complete the work on the unified field theory. He and other mathematicians did complete the equations which gave us the field for invisibility. After decades of secrecy, is it possible that the truth about American citizens being used as scientific guinea pigs is finally coming up? We all go through life accepting what textbooks told us about the universe. But what happens when questions are raised about many of our fundamental beliefs? A mystery that cannot be explained. An enigma that defies reason. A surprising and unexpected answer. To encounter such a mystery firsthand may change your life forever. Face to face with the greatest riddles of the ages. The world's most profound mysteries reach out and touch your life in ways you've never imagined possible. Encounters with the Unexplained For years, rumors of bizarre secret government experiments have surfaced, filtering into the public media from strange and unlikely sources. For example, Nazi doctors on trial at Nuremberg following World War II sought to justify their actions by pointing to an experiment conducted in Chicago prisons in which 400 prisoners were infected with malaria in order to study the effects of new and experimental drugs. Whether or not the prisoners were told what was happening to them is still open to question. But this was hardly the beginning of such reports. One of the most disturbing experiments was allegedly undertaken in 1931 when a single pathologist, Dr. Cornelius Rhodes of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Investigations, according to reports, knowingly infected his human subjects with cancer. Dr. Rhodes's attitude towards his subjects is apparent in a letter used as the basis for a criminal investigation into his actions. What we need is not public health work, but a tidal wave or something to totally exterminate the population. The criminal case was dismissed, however, by the prosecutor appointed by the North American governor of Puerto Rico. His reason was that Rhodes was merely mentally ill or a person of few scruples. Dr. Rhodes went on to direct the establishment of U.S. Army Chemical Warfare Laboratories in Maryland, Utah, and the Panama Canal Zone. This doctor, who was described as mentally ill, was subsequently awarded the Legion of Merit and appointed to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. Atomic energy, of course, gave the entire world something new and terribly frightening to think about, and the people at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, a 560-square-mile manufacturing plant in southeastern Washington, apparently thought their friends and neighbors in the Great Northwest wouldn't mind being used as test subjects. One of the largest intentional releases of radiation in history took place at Hanford in 1949. Known as the Green Run, it was purposely kept from the public for nearly 40 years. Later, documents released by the Department of Energy show that Hanford had secretly released 8,000 curies of radioactive iodine. Allegedly, 
The radiation was released to monitor the radioactive plume stretching across Oregon and Washington. This was done in order to evaluate equipment used for detecting Soviet plutonium plants. No one living downwind from Hanford was ever warned or evacuated, and the Green Run was only one release. To give you some idea of what was going on at Hanford, the Three Mile Island accident vented between 15 and 24 curies of radioactive iodine. Between 1944 and 1947, Hanford emitted an estimated 685,000 curies of radiation into the environment. That is a staggering amount. To bring the point a little closer to home, there have been reports recently of contrails, trails of gaseous substances left in the wake of jet planes flying high above certain areas of the country. A mysterious sickness seems to be centered around these contrails left by KC-135s and KC-10 aerial tankers that were supposedly seeding clouds. Officially, the Air Force denies it is involved in anything associated with these sightings, but in a recent article, Tommy Farmer, former engineering technician with Raytheon Missile Systems, says he has collected samples of what he calls angel hair, sprayed by the mystery aircraft on six occasions since February of 1998. No one knows where the planes are coming from or where they land when they're finished. However, some reports indicate the phenomenon is weather modification related. And the Air Force has said the military can find ways to own the weather by the year 2025. So what it comes down to is, all of this is supposed to be for our own good, or for the sake of national security, whether we like it or not. But if that's the case, why aren't we being told about it? It's not as if we're at war. But then maybe even that wouldn't make a difference. Even with World War II raging and the obvious need for secrecy, one of the most bizarre government experiments of all time took place right here at the Philadelphia Naval Station, and the results still shock and mystify those who were part of it. The story actually begins in January of 1956. A man by the name of Morris K. Jessup, a former university mathematics and astronomy instructor with a keen interest in Einstein's unified field theory, received the first of two letters from a man who signed himself Carlos Miguel Allende, or Carl Allen. In these rambling, sometimes almost incoherent letters, Allen warned Jessup to forget his interest in the unified field theory, stating that the U.S. Navy had already tried it on a destroyer-type ship in 1943. The result was, and stands today as proof, that the unified field theory, to a certain extent, is correct. The result was complete invisibility of a ship and all of its crew. Jessup assumed the letter came to him in response to a book he had published in 1955 called The Case for the UFO. The book had become the hot topic of the cocktail circuit in Washington, D.C., and an annotated copy even found its way to the Office of Naval Research, where the notations in the margins and above and below the text drew the attention of two ONR officers. The officers claimed that their interest was purely personal and had nothing to do with naval research. Still, they called Jessup in to evaluate the notations. Jessup received another letter from Allende within just a few days of the first. He opened his mail and read... I wish to mention that somehow, also, the experimental ship disappeared from its Philadelphia dock and only a very few minutes later appeared at its other dock in the Norfolk Portsmouth area. This was distinctly and clearly identified as being that place, but the ship then again disappeared and went back to the Philadelphia dock in only a very few minutes. That assertion must have been a jolt to Jessup, since the two naval stations are some 400 miles apart. It would take days, not minutes, to get a destroyer-type vessel from one berth to the other and back. The letters seemed alternately desperate and angry, occasionally even pleading, and inexplicably, Jessup turned the letters over to the two naval officers who had the annotated copy of his book. He was sure, he told them, that at least some of the notations were Allende's. Whether or not Jessup ever made any further inquiries is unknown. His involvement ended on the evening of April 20th, 1959, when he was found dead in his station wagon in Dade County Park in Florida. Jessup, it appeared, had committed suicide, even though this was heavily disputed by his family and friends. 
Jessup's friends insisted he was not the kind of man to commit suicide, but nothing was ever found to suggest anything else. But one thing was certain. In the three years since he received the first letter from Allende, until his death, Jessup had been the main factor in seeing to it that the tight lid of secrecy surrounding the Philadelphia experiment was ripped away. The Navy, while insisting no such experiment ever took place, was nevertheless suddenly very interested in anyone requesting information about the USS Eldridge. And nearly 30 years later, this man, Alfred Bielek, would make it all but impossible to put the lid of secrecy back in place. My original family name is Edward Cameron. When I first became aware of my involvement with the Philadelphia Experiment in January of 1988, I had no idea how extensive my use by the government had been, nor where my research would lead. But it includes the Philadelphia Experiment, the Montauk Project, mind control, some discussion of aliens, and it all fits together. Trying to understand how they fit together in the complex web that has been created is the purpose of my bringing to you vital information which has been kept from you by your government and the media. What was the Philadelphia experiment exactly and why would the US Navy have been spearheading the research in the first place? At the time that the Philadelphia experiment was supposed to have taken place, German U-boats were destroying nearly half of the shipping that was going across the Atlantic. Both the British Admiralty and the U.S. Navy were desperate in finding a way of combating this lethal threat. If scientists of the caliber of Albert Einstein and Nikola Tesla had even remotely suggested the possibility of turning a large naval ship invisible, even if it was only invisible to enemy radar, the admirals would have certainly have decided to explore that option. The stated purpose of the experiment was to prove whether or not you could make a ship invisible to radar. The original purpose was optical invisibility. Two scientists came forth with unproven theories which became part of this experiment. By 1943 in the United States, Einstein's concept of the ideas of the interaction of electricity, gravity, and magnetism seemed suited to the idea of electronic camouflage. But implementation of the theory would require the use of some of the concepts of another great scientist, Nikola Tesla. Tesla was the project originator and its first director. Einstein and others, including Dr. John von Neumann, worked together to perfect the theory. All of these men worked together very closely on this project, and I was privileged to work with them in my original Edward Cameron timeline. The stage was now set for a journey into the unexplored realms of science. But did the Navy or even the scientists know it would also be a journey into the future? Did any of them really believe it was possible for a massive warship to just suddenly become invisible? And who exactly is Ed Cameron? And what does his so-called timeline have to do with anything? The ship chosen for the experiment was a non-commissioned destroyer escort named the USS Eldridge at a later date. So far as can be determined, none of the 30-plus men aboard the ship were told what the test was all about. All they knew was that they were going to make us invisible. The crew was comprised of specially selected and screened volunteers from the entire Navy, including non-coms. But was this something that the government would take seriously, even if the scientists proposed it? In the late 1970s, Dr. James Corum recruited a group of scientists just for fun to see if there was any scientific basis for the events that were supposed to have taken place during the Philadelphia experiment. To their astonishment, there was. In a laboratory, they were able to replicate radar invisibility using what is known as Tesla's egg of Columbus. So, it is entirely plausible that in 1943, they had the sufficient knowledge to conduct the Philadelphia experiment. In fact, from what was known of the technology, it would have been derelict behavior of the Defense Science Research Board not to have conducted such experiments. The device invented by Tesla for producing high voltages with low current is today used in one form or another in most radio and TV sets. It permits weak circuits to sustain voltage of almost any magnitude. His theories were perfect for the task at hand, but Tesla became disenchanted with the entire project. 
He was convinced that his inventions were being appropriated for purposes not beneficial to mankind. The experiment was originally called Project Rainbow after it was classified and it was executed in two parts. The trial run from the standpoint of invisibility went very well, but the effect on the sailors on deck was horrific. Sailors were sick, some were completely disoriented, but the objectives and goals of invisibility had been achieved. The decision was made to go ahead with the second phase of this test, with the test crew and two scientists on board. Those two scientists were myself and my brother. We also had on board my younger brother Jim, who was a Navy seaman and part of the test crew. Tesla walked out on Project Rainbow in March of 1942 and was replaced by a man who by war's end would become a legend among scientists, Dr. John von Neumann. It's here that lives and timelines begin to converge. I began my life on August 4th, 1916 in Bayshore, Long Island. My name then was Edward Cameron in that timeline. I and my brother Duncan grew up there. I went to Princeton in 1932, where I met Dr. John von Neumann for the first time. I later earned my PhD in physics at Harvard University, while Brother Duncan went on to University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Scotland, where he earned his PhD in physics. After I left Harvard, my brother and I were recruited by Dr. John von Neumann to work on the Navy's invisibility project. We had to relearn our physics to include time, gravity, and quantum physics, but Dr. John von Neumann was an excellent teacher especially since I was reporting directly to the Navy, was of theories of invisibility. It was during this time that I met Dr. Einstein and Nikola Tesla. Although both men had already essentially left the project, they maintained a keen interest in its progress. No, we didn't get the wrong pictures on the screen. Al Bielek, the man speaking in the first person, is Ed Cameron, whose life and family are well documented. But in order to understand how Ed Cameron got to be Al Bielek, we have to go back to August 12, 1943, and the ill-fated second test. According to the letters written by Carl Allen to Morris Jessup, the second test didn't take place in the harbor, but somewhere in the open sea. The result was complete invisibility of a ship and all of its crew while at sea. The field was effective in an oblate spheroidal shape, extending 100 yards, more or less, out from each beam of the ship. Any person without that sphere could see nothing save the clearly defined shape of the ship's hull in the water. Carl Allen, or Allende, is the only person not aboard the USS Eldridge that day to come forward as an eyewitness. He claimed to have been aboard the steamer SS Andrew Faroseth as it passed within a hundred yards of the Eldridge just as the test got underway. He was so close, he said, that he actually shoved his hand and arm up to the elbow into the visible force field that extended from the ship. Many years later, Allen described what he saw for investigators. I watched the air all around the ship turn slightly, ever so slightly darker than all the other air. I saw, after a few minutes, a foggy green mist arise like a thin cloud. I watched as thereafter the DE-173 became rapidly invisible to human eyes. I don't know what Carl Allen may have seen that day. So many strange things happened. But the USS Elders disappeared from its location in the Philadelphia Harbor. My brother Duncan and I boarded the Eldridge that day with the understanding that this was to be a test to determine radar invisibility only. We were not attempting optical invisibility, but it happened anyway, at least partially. You could barely see the ship through a thick green fog. We obtained radar and visibility in about 70 seconds, but that's when things began to get strange. We didn't know it in the control room, but the ship disappeared right out of the harbor. There was a hole where the ship had been, and then all of a sudden, there was no hole. It was just calm waters. Duncan and I saw the banks of electron tubes glowing in a strange way. Then we started getting high voltage arcing, like tiny lightning bolts. The radio was nothing but static. We went for the main power controls, but they were frozen, so we decided we had to get out of there. But up on deck, things were even worse. There was a greenish haze everywhere. Sailors were wandering around, totally disoriented, almost to the point of being crazy. We couldn't shut down the equipment, and we could not contact anyone ashore, and we had no idea what was happening to the rest of the crew, so we decided to jump overboard, but we never hit the water. 
We felt like we were falling through a tunnel. We didn't know where we were or what was going on. But after what I guess was about two minutes of this, we wound up in a military base at night with a chain link fence at our backs. Suddenly there was this helicopter beaming a light in our faces, and we didn't even know what a helicopter was. They were still experimental in 1943. The next thing that happened was the military police came out. They grabbed us, took us to a building, and then pushed us on an elevator. We went down several floors where, upon exiting, we were met by an elderly man who introduced himself as Dr. von Neumann. We thought this old man must be crazy. He couldn't be Dr. von Neumann. We had left him about an hour before, and he was a much younger man. But that was just the beginning of the surprises in store for Ed Cameron and his brother Duncan. The man who introduced himself as von Neumann informed them that they were not in Philadelphia in 1943, but in Montauk, Long Island, and the year was 1983. He then began to show them some technological wonders undreamed of in 1943. This was, he said, the home of the Phoenix Project. The Eldridge was now in hyperspace, and the hyperspace bubble was growing. Van Neumann said we had to go back to the Eldridge and smash the equipment in order to shut it down. He also told us that they had complete control and could send us to any time and place. They put us into this time tunnel, and then we were back on the Eldridge. Then we grabbed axes and started smashing equipment. Eventually it started to wind down, and then we were back at the starting point in the harbor. It was then that the horror of it all became evident to us. For some of the men, the experience had been simply too much of a strain. Some were dead of heart failure or who knows what. Others were completely disoriented, not knowing where they had been or where they were. But most horrible of all, some of the men, like our younger brother Jimmy, were buried in the steel deck and the bulkheads. As the fields collapsed, the molecular structure of the sailor's body was also shifting. If they were near a bulkhead when it rematerialized, they were stuck in it. Duncan couldn't handle seeing Jim like that. He jumped overboard again and disappeared into the future. I stayed with Jimmy and waited there until the fields collapsed. Is it possible that this rather ordinary-looking U.S. Navy ship could have gone through all that? Did it go skipping through hyperspace like a flat rock on a pond, bouncing into the future and back again? For all intents and purposes, there were only two witnesses, Carl Allen or Carlos Allende, whose letters to astronomer and UFO author Morris K. Jessup started the whole investigation, and Al Bielik, known as Ed Cameron during the time of the Philadelphia experiment, and candidly, his fantastic tale of timelines and hyperspace leave many people scratching their heads. Is there anything else, any hint of outside corroboration for these stories? Allen did refer to an article in a Philadelphia newspaper that describes an uproar in a dockside bar, but this story was about a different kind of uproar. According to the report, three sailors suddenly appeared in the bar as if coming out of a back room. The problem is, there was no back room in the bar. Even more startling, they left the same way they came in, through the back wall. Both Albert Einstein and Nikola Tesla had given up their experiments with a unified field theory years before the actual experiment, and in spite of the Navy's statements to the contrary, a number of investigators are convinced the government did in fact test not only optical invisibility, but a time machine that day. But we've only begun to examine the complex controversy that began in 1943 and continues into some as yet unknown future. Were time travel experiments really going on at Fort Hero in Montauk, Long Island in the 1980s? What was or is the Phoenix Project? And who were the Montauk Boys? Many parts of this fractured tale of technology gone berserk are difficult to believe. It reads like a combination of H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, and Bridie Murphy. Yet the story is filled with names, places, and dates that are subject to verification. And a number of serious investigators have devoted a vast amount of time and money to doing just that. And as you might expect, the Navy has not been particularly helpful. Ever since the story of the Philadelphia experiment began circulating in 1956, and during the nearly 50 years between then and now, the United States Navy has steadfastly and emphatically denied that any such experiment took place. 
that the technology to perform such a feat did not exist then and in fact does not exist today. Maybe we should pause here for just a moment to catch our breath. A story that began with two letters to an astronomer who was promoting Einstein's unified field theory has now become a sort of urban legend involving time travel. Let's look closely and see what we really know. Carl Allen didn't actually witness the teleportation because he said he read about that in a Philadelphia newspaper some years earlier. And it should be noted that right up to his death, Carl Allen never wavered from his story. We also know there was a closed facility of some kind at Fort Hero in Montauk, Long Island. It is, in fact, still there. What we see today is just the tip of the iceberg. In actuality, under the Montauk facility is a very large underground base. The base stretches out for miles, maybe five miles. It would take us uh, 15 to 20 minutes to ride in a golf cart from one end to the other end. And the computer technology we had at Montauk was the fastest known in the world in the mid-70s. We actually had Cray 1s and Cray 2s, which were the fastest computers that were made at the time. There are others who claim to have been at Montauk working on the project. Stuart Swerdlow says he was repeatedly brought to the base between the ages of 14 and 27. Because of my genetic background and my family history, I was taken into use in the project at a very early age and an early phase. Initially, I thought there were alien beings in control of it. However, later on, I discovered it was the military and the guise of aliens who actually manipulated it. My earliest memories involve mind control experimentation, techniques and tactics that were used on the test subjects, so that they could be later used on the general population. Later on, they went into genetic manipulations, and finally into time travel experiments. We also know that the government will confirm none of this. To the contrary, they emphatically deny that any such experiments, tests, or research took place in Philadelphia in 1943 or in Montauk at any time. But independent testimony continues to suggest that something out of the ordinary did indeed take place. When I was brought out to the actual project in 1968, I was informed that the project was actually a carry-on from the Philadelphia experiment. I was actually given the final report for the Philadelphia experiment to review, and it actually listed the Cameron brothers, Ed and Duncan Cameron, as the Navy liaison officers. Could it be there is something to the stories after all? The evidence is all circumstantial. But is it compelling enough to warrant further investigation? At Montauk, we had a system that we called the Montauk chair, which was actually a lounge chair with a group of coils around it that, through quantum electromagnetic processes, actually picked up the thoughts, put it into a group of receivers designed and built by Nikola Tesla in the 30s, which are even today very unique. This then was digitized and put into a computer system where the thoughts are actually decoded in red, and then from there, it went to the radar transmitter, the radar tower was sent out into the electromagnetic background, in order to affect uh, the thoughts of other people. This is not so far-fetched because today the Air Force is using head movement, eye movements, electroencephalogram readings in order to control the flight of some of the very advanced airplanes. The Montauk Project technology created portals in time and space through which people traveled. Initially, the test subjects were considered disposable and many of them were lost. Later on, they developed a core group known as the Montauk Boys. They traveled through time and space effortlessly. However, the tragedy was that less than 1% of them survived the experimentation. But all of this was going on in the 60s and 70s. Dr. John von Neumann, who is generally considered the father of the modern computer, supposedly died in the 50s. Was there a computer technology capable of these remarkable feats back then? Who could have designed such sophisticated hardware and software? It was alien technology. We simply didn't have the theory, but we had the technical expertise and capability to build the hardware to their specifications. Our government has been working with aliens for years. 
Einstein's unified field theory was an attempt to demonstrate that all fundamental forces could be shown in a single basic field. It has been a dream of physicists for most of the 20th century, but it is only recently that the world's physicists have found a theory that is crazy enough to meet the requirement. It's called the super string theory, and it's far too complicated for most of us to understand. So why bring it up? Only because it is the concept of a unified field that makes things like hyperspace and time travel even remotely possible. And there are those who believe the government did not abandon the research when they closed Montauk. I don't believe the final chapter on Montauk has yet been written. When I was there in 1992, I saw evidence that the base had been reactivated. New coax cable runs, new power transformers have been put into the power substations, and the radar tower that used to be wide open now has a steel door with double padlocks. And we found other evidence that shows that the base was being reactivated. There were new entrances to the underground with special interlocked doors. In the past 15 years, I've discovered that I was essentially raised by the government. Perhaps I should say government-designated parents. And I want to tell you there's a lot more going on with these government projects than anybody cares to even think about. It's difficult to explain. It's even difficult for me to comprehend, and I'm living it. I have very clear memories of several different timelines. For example, I was an aircraft and engine mechanic in the Air Force working on jet engines. But when I tried to contact my old Air Force buddies, people that I worked with and partied with, they didn't even know me. I have memories of Montauk, and I believe that Montauk was never really shut down. Is Al Bielik the sole surviving member of a markedly successful but incredibly tragic experiment? If Montauk was shut down in 1983, did the government just abandon space-time research? Or will the ghost of the Eldridge come back to haunt us again in the 21st century? There's still a huge void between what we know and what we'd like to know. That the Montauk Laboratory existed is not in dispute. It is, in fact, still there today. The project itself, however, appears to have been shut down in the mid-1980s. Could that have merely been a ruse to give them time to rebuild and update the facility? Is it possible that the Phoenix Project, under some other guise and in some other place, is still going on? Are terms like hyperspace, the space-time continuum, and the time travel paradox seriously discussed in clandestine scientific circles, or are they just the stuff science fiction is made of? You can be sure there's a lot of research taking place in the field of uh, quantum physics and uh, parallel realities and hyperspace. We're not talking about length, width, height, and time here. We're talking about actual parallel reference frames, parallel realities, different dimensions, different universes to us. There is data in the theories that suggest we have possibly 21 realities or reference frames wrapped up in the existence we know. There is nothing more important to quantum physicists than studying how all these different reference frames interrelate to each other. But doesn't this go far beyond the idea of radar or even optical invisibility? Was the Philadelphia experiment a research accident or was it the means to an end? Later on, Duncan and some of the others saw the project as pure evil and wanted to destroy it. But Dr. von Neumann, who by the way did not die in the 50s, wanted to keep it. He thought that it was a valuable research tool that would be essential in combating what he saw as very serious threats to the security of the United States in the future. But research into what and at what cost? Could it be that the Eldridge and its crew were not the only U.S. military personnel to run afoul of the Philadelphia experiment? Encounters has recently learned that investigators now believe yet another experiment was launched using the same technology. But this time, instead of naval vessels, the subject of the experiment was aircraft. For over 40 years, the disappearance of Flight 19 from a Fort Lauderdale air base in the mid-1940s has been written off as just another of the many Bermuda Triangle anomalies. But now a German historian and investigative journalist, Michael Preisinger, has uncovered information never before published in the U.S., suggesting a different explanation. One of my sources, who uses the name Joe Smith, which I'm certain is not his real name, 
provided me with copies of documents that tell a chilling story. Following the disastrous results aboard the USS Eldridge, the Navy decided to proceed, but with much smaller objects. Their first project would be an attempt to create fog banks that aircraft could slip into following an attack and disappear from view. The Grumman Avenger torpedo bomber was chosen for the first experiment, which was dubbed burning glass. But when the equipment arrived at the Naval Air Station in Fort Lauderdale, where the experiment was to take place, it was discovered that it was too big to fit in the torpedo bay. It would have to go into the rear gunner's cockpit. That meant that when the equipment was reconfigured and put aboard the lead aircraft, one crewman would have to be left behind. When the flight took off on December 4th, 1945, Corporal Alan Cosner did not go up. That much, at least, is well established. The flight had proceeded from Fort Lauderdale to Chicken Shoals and had made their turn for the return when Captain Charles Taylor activated burning glass. According to my informant, instead of creating a fog bank, a mini wormhole opened up just ahead of the planes. Within seconds, they were thrown out of time and dimension, vanishing into an infinite eternity. What could have been the purpose of the Navy's continuing research? The war was over when Flight 19 disappeared. Could it be the equipment was never designed for creating camouflage at all, but something far more sophisticated? Something that might one day aid in interstellar travel? To the average person, all of this sounds nothing short of preposterous. Someone once said three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. Could the government have actually kept all of this under wraps for nearly half a century? Short of the Navy throwing open the doors of the Montauk installation or giving serious journalists access to all of their World War II research files, there doesn't seem to be any way of corroborating Carl Allen's letters to Morris K. Jessup or Al Bielik's incredible memories. If past government responses to questions that touch on UFOs is any indication, nobody will see the inside of Montauk or the Navy files anytime soon. But could there be a more rational explanation for all of this? Let's go back to that newspaper article Alan referred to for a moment. Several city police officers responding to a call to aid members of the Navy Shore Patrol in breaking up a tavern brawl near the U.S. Navy docks here last night got something of a surprise when they arrived on the scene to find the place empty of customers. The Shore Patrol arrived first and cleared the place out, but not before two of the sailors involved allegedly did a disappearing act. They just sort of vanished into thin air, right there, reported one of the frightened hostesses, and she added, I ain't been drinking neither. But there is another version of this story. A man by the name of Edward Dudgeon claims to have been there, and he gave a very different account. In fact, Dudgeon says he was one of the two sailors who were supposed to have disappeared. It's not very complicated. A couple of sailors were bragging about new equipment on their ship, and someone told them to shut up, and a fight broke out. That would explain the sailor's disappearance. But what about the ship itself? According to an interview that Jacques Belli conducted with Edward Dudgeon, who was a witness on the USS Engstrom, which was the ship right next to the Eldridge, uh, the Eldridge pulled out of harbor that night at 11 p.m. And it was also back in Philadelphia Harbor um, the next morning, which seems impossible. But if you look at the map, you'll see that merchant ships would have taken two days to make the trip, going around submarine nets, mines, and so on. But the Navy used a special inland channel, the Chesapeake-Delaware Canal, that bypassed all that. Well, Dudgeon claimed that the Eldridge made that trip in about six hours. Is this the sort of mundane stuff legends grow out of? Did Carl Allen make it all up? Is there any reason to believe Al Bielik's incredible story? More importantly, does the government use its citizens, particularly the military, to test new technologies and especially new weapons? In September of 1977, during the Joint Attack Weapon System test, a UFO was reported at Fort Benning, Georgia. This was not your average, every day we watched until it flew away kind of sighting. If the reports are accurate, and I believe they are, the Army at Fort Benning actually went to war with an alien spaceship. I have just arrived at the 1st Battalion Post, 
Fort Benning, Georgia, and I was assigned to Delta Company, 1st Battalion, 1st Infantry. On Tuesday night, about 10.30, all the lights in the camp began to flicker on and off, almost like a strobe light. This was highly unusual, and Vasquez, along with the other soldiers, decided to arm themselves. The whole battalion was moving away from the 1st Battalion post when we saw lights coming up the road. It was a general, the gunner, and a driver in a jeep. I thought the problem was electrical, but the general ordered us to move down the road just in case. Then a bright searchlight scanned across us from behind the trees. I thought this was some kind of military test, but I never seen anything like this. An Alpha and Bravo company ran across the field and drew fire. It wasn't tracers, but small balls of white lights hitting the men. I was firing my M16 into the tree line, and I could hear my bullets hitting something. But it had no effect. Those balls of white lights kept on coming. What was it that Private Vasquez, the soldiers of Delta Company, and the helicopter were all shooting at that night? Were they under attack from an alien spaceship, or could it have been something else? I sent Dr. Stephen Greer, director of Sea City, a report of what happened at Fort Benning. His best guess is that this was some kind of exotic defense system used for mind control. He thought that my company was involved in some kind of psychological warfare test. Lost or altered memories, time travels, and battles with mysterious unknown enemies. Are we the target of some sinister alien force? Or are we just being used as unwitting guinea pigs for secret projects designed by mysterious entities who think they know what's best for us? Could it in fact be some sort of conspiracy? Perhaps the question we should be asking is, has anything good come out of all of this?